Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. Um, before we get into the utter mess that was Thursday night, uh, we've had a press conference today, an unusual, uh, well, unusually timed one. We don't normally have Saturday press conferences, but we have, so I'll have a little chat about that first so you can get the more recent news before I uh, rant a little bit about Thursday night. And uh, hopefully this will also be the last time you see me looking like a man who's just emerged from a cave, what with hairdressers being opened and things like that. So, uh, Let's get cracking straight into it. Uh, yeah, afternoon press conference today. Jose Mourinho, um, he was in, I say good form, but obviously he's not going to be absolutely chipper and upbeat, is he, after what happened on Thursday night. But what he was, was he wasn't looking to make excuses. You know, a couple of um, members of the media tried to draw him on the VAR again. And to be honest, I think he did what was the right thing. He kind of said, you know, yes, it was ridiculous and all of that. And he still went on about feeling that the VAR referee is the actual referee nowadays rather than the assistant. Um, sorry, rather that the referee in the middle of the pitch is now the assistant. Um, but he was very clear in saying, look, it was a thing that went against us, but we lost that match because of the way we played. Um, it wasn't anything to do with the VAR. Of course, going in 1-1 at half-time is a, is a slightly different scenario, but he said it's all about the mentality and the way we react to things like that. And it is a massive thing, especially this season. Kind of That, that led me on to when I got my questions in. I, I asked him, I said, you know, you, you spoke about the mentality, and he said this after the match the other night. He said about how, you know, heads just drop too easily. Any negative thing, maybe a goalkeeper make a mistake... A uh, striker missing a shot, um, you know, a red card, although Spurs haven't really had that this season, VAR incidents, little things like that just going against you. He said, and, and, and I said, obviously, you've got those you spoke about mentality. You also spoke the other day about mentality, about having top players on the bench, you know, on Dembele and how in a big club, that's just the way it is. You have top players in the team and on the bench. So there's that, and he also spoke about the away form. So I said, like, collectively, with all of that, you know, you're very clearly saying Tottenham don't have a big club mentality. And quite frankly, how can they? With one trophy in 20 years, it is, it's absurd, isn't it? So I kind of asked him, how do you transform that? You know, you're a guy who has been at the biggest clubs in the world. You've, you've won all of these things. How do you transfer the mentality you're used to in other clubs to Tottenham Hotspur? Um, and he had a little think about it, and then he said, to be honest, it's time. It's all about time. He said it's, it's changing the, almost like the fabric of the way things have been done. He, oh, that was the word. He, the phrase he used was changing the soul of the club. Um, and it's difficult to argue against it. You know, we all know about the glory days of the past and, you know, Bill Nick's side and stuff like that. And, but, but when you look at it over a sustained amount of time, obviously Tottenham are very much were a cup team. I say were because they're not even a cup team anymore. So he was kind of saying it is essentially it's, it's giving a club a new soul and, and he, he kind of used, I think the expression he used was he said in some clubs you'll go in and you'll find already set uh, a mentality um, and the kind of players for exactly what you want to do. And then he said in some clubs you'll find fantastic group of players who just have a different psychological makeup. And you presume obviously he's talking about Tottenham there. Um, and he said he kind of used Liverpool as an analogy. He said, obviously, Liverpool, you can very much see the players that were there and then were brought in that fit the philosophy of what they wanted to do. And obviously, that's kind of hinting at with Tottenham. But really interestingly for me, I then led him on with that question to, to ask about, well, you know, what you're, you've obviously got quite a young team and you are looking to add uh, that winning mentality, that experience. So I said, so does that mean in the transfer window you'll look to bring in older, more experienced players with, with that mentality, expecting him to say, well, you know, one or two obviously would be great because you know, Spurs are losing a lot of experience. You know, if Tongan goes, you've got Vaughan, who's a kind of an older head in the dressing room, if not on the pitch, um, Ericsson, Dembele, Wanyama, Trippier, they've all gone. It's a very young team. You know, six players signed last or this season were all 23 and under. Um, so I expected him to say yes, you know, bring in a couple of older heads. And he actually went completely the other way. He said no. He said, I'm not looking to go in that direction. He said, for me, it's not about age. It's about the makeup of a player, uh, the kind of the mentality they come in with. And I kind of thought about it. And I think in, in other clubs, he has brought in more experienced players. He 
has benefited though from having some younger players like John Terry who you know just have that winning mentality even though they were younger especially in his first spell at Chelsea so it's quite interesting that there's a part of you that wonders is that just him keeping in with Tottenham's transfer policy that we know Tottenham buy young and look to have uh, players with potential and obviously possibly future sell-on value or simply ones that can become stars is he just keeping in line with that because he's been already told look we're not going to sign older players or is it very much that he thinks that in this very different club that he's going to try and have success with he can still do it and maybe he's looking at maybe not young young players but maybe I mean a good example is um, Pierre um, Hoiberg Pierre um, Emil Hoiberg from Southampton you know He's 24, so he's not older, but he has come in and become the Southampton captain. Well, until he announced pretty much his intention to leave. So, you know, you've got a, a younger guy there who is a leader and Spurs are interested in him. So does that mean that's the kind of type? Are you looking at those kind of type of players? You know, we know about the likes of Max Ahrens and Spurs will always look at these young players like Max Ahrens. Is he um, at QPR or is he... Um, and then you've got, you know, maybe that slightly older band, like I say, with Hoiberg, who's 24, and then uh, Milik um, at Napoli, who's 25, 26. You know, do you do you then have to look for that? Uh, players that, yeah, if, if they were to spend a bit of money on, I think they're all barring Aaron's in the last year of their contracts. Uh, but I thought it was quite interesting because it does rule out a lot of those older players. You know, Mourinho could always turn around if they sign an older player and say, oh, the opportunity presented itself. But we know it's very much in keeping with the way Spurs have always been. Um, so I do quite, I find that really fascinating in a way that can someone as big a stature and as dominant a personality as Mourinho actually be happy to fall in with a very different philosophy? Um, because then obviously you have the paradox of falling in line with something that's worked before to a certain extent, but then also wanting to bring in a winning mentality to that team, a different psychological profile to it. How do you do that if you're following old ways? It's, it's really interesting. So I'll be interested to see how that actually works going forward. Uh, so that was kind of my section of the press conference where I was chatting with him about stuff. Um, he also said Deli Alley, hamstring problem in training. His gut feeling that you should be okay for Everton, but obviously the medical staff being very careful with him because, you know, his history with hamstring problems, Delhi, it's it's not been great. Uh, Tanganga, he said he's back in training next week, although he kind of added the caveat that maybe be back for the last game of the season, he said, but they're quite wary about that purely because it's a bit similar to the Rashford injury. that is a, like a, a stress fracture in the back. And he said it's such a big injury that maybe it's just better leaving it now for next season. Um, and, it, you know, Tanganga is going to be a big part of the Tottenham future. So I think that's probably the best thing to do, isn't it? You know, let's let's be honest, the season is kind of petering out. Champions League football looks to be off the table for next season. Europa League may be still a chance. Um, but obviously, whether that's the biggest driver in terms of the club and finances and bringing in players and things like that is another thing. So probably it's not a time to take massive risks on players. Um, but the other interesting thing he said that kind of struck a chord with me, he said the biggest thing he took away from the Sheffield United match, he said, other than, you know, the VAR stuff, was that uh, he the expression he used was the lack of or the desire that Spurs didn't have compared to Sheffield United disturbed me, was the expression he used. Um, anyone that's obviously been keeping a close eye on Tottenham knows that that lack of desire has been there a fair bit. You know, it's essentially what Pochettino got, it got him sacked. Because, you know, some of those matches were absolutely dreadful. Um, and there comes a point in the second half in some games where, where Spurs players have just switched off. And that's where there's got to be this enormous mentality shift. There's there's almost a collective woe is me feeling about it. And they do. Their heads drop. And, you know, I mean, let's get into the match on Thursday because we can't avoid it. It's like a big elephant in the room. Horrible. Uh, it, it was just shocking. I mean... Like I said, I'd seen promising things in the uh, matches against United and West Ham, and you could kind of see the defensive structure, you could see what was going to be built upon, and it was essentially just blown apart on um, Thursday night. For me, it was all about width. That was the biggest issue for me. Tottenham had 
three wingers on the pitch plus Oreo, who essentially is a winger, and they didn't use the width at all until like the 90th minute. Sheffield United, every single time they attacked, used the width and were constantly a danger. And all three of their goals came from wide positions, balls in from there. Um, it was really disappointing. The back four that had been drilled so well um, just uh, committed silly mistakes and then their heads went down. You could see it. Um, yeah, everything. All the good little kind of signs and pointers. It was almost like a back to the drawing board moment. Um, and I think Mourinho's probably... Having had this second chance, essentially, with, you know, the break and getting injured players back, it's probably a part of them that's now thinking, I just want to get to the next season now. Um, I think there's still lots he can do with these remaining games in terms of looking at players. But yeah, I mean, I'll have a brief talk about VAR, but I don't want to go into it too much because everyone knows my utter hatred uh, of the way VAR is implemented. Um, and, you know, it's ridiculous. A player being fouled, falling forward... And then someone booting the ball off of what still looks to me like his shoulder. Um, and then it going into the path of Kane. How that isn't a goal, it's just ridiculous. I know the law states that it should be ruled off, but it's just crazy. Absolutely crazy. Um, so hopefully that will get changed. I do agree completely with Mourinho that the referee is no longer the referee. They don't make decisions. You know, they, they often are just waiting to see what happened, um, what happens. I mean, I was watching the United match earlier, and Mike Dean, despite all the criticism about him, he was actually making decisions. Uh, but most of the referees aren't. There was a big dig at Michael Oliver, you know, Mourinho saying that sometimes referees that aren't good on the pitch are, are being able to control the game from a room somewhere. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a mess. It, it's really got to, they've got to go away and look at it and decide just how much they want VAR to be involved. Because some of the things, like, you know, someone's toe being offside, their elbow. Um, a handball decision that really isn't a handball decision. I mean, what was Mora supposed to do? Is he meant to literally face plant into the ground as the only way after being fouled? And even after that, Spurs didn't even get a free kick on the edge of the box. It was just, it was a mess. But yeah, as Mourinho says, it's not an excuse for the way Spurs played. So let's look at it, that, you know, the back four. Uh, well, actually, let's talk about the width thing I was going on about. You know, for me, that was just, it was weird. Spurs... Mourinho picked three wingers up front. He played Bergwijn as kind of a number 10, but essentially in Son, Bergwijn and Lucas, you've got three wingers or prefer to be out wide. And then you're shoving Serge Aurier up the right-hand side in an advanced role, which means you're kind of doing that. So Lucas is always, for me, is most ineffective when you're pushing him in field and then he just drives through a really congested pitch because that's, let's be honest, for all of Lucas' good points, he does have this go-to thing of just running straight forward. And he'll beat one or two players, and then he'll give away the ball to the, the third defender. That's exactly really, weirdly what happened with the VAR decision. Um, so you really don't want to push him inside. Bergvine is maybe slightly better at that. He's probably better with his decision-making when he gets into that last moment. And then Son, you know, Son was probably the one that had a slight bit of width because Davies... Um, was more defensive in, in his role. But Son, Son's a funny one. He's the most incredibly talented player. And if you look at his stats this season, you'd probably say, look, hey, he scored goals when Kane was out. He's come up with assists. Um, he had a really good run before his um, arm injury. But actually, in terms of his performance, he's actually nowhere near where Son's been previously. It could be a confidence thing. It could be a tiredness thing. Um but it's just not quite the Son we know. You know, that Son that played against Burnley and rampaged through the centre, uh, arguably, yeah, the centre of the pitch, going all the way. We haven't really seen many of those runs. It's, it's, he doesn't seem to take on his man as much. Um, it's really weird from him because a fully fit and firing Son is, is brilliant. And I still don't feel we're seeing the best of him. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of Harry Kane, I did feel sorry for him. You know, I see him, get he gets stick sometimes and he's still got his goal. But I felt it's just a bit like the United match. He wasn't getting the service. If you're not getting the ball into you, what are you meant to do as a striker? If you come deep, you're leaving the team with no focal point up front. Um, and, you know, weirdly, he actually had the ball in the net three times, was it? Um, the VAR, there was an offside decision and obviously putting it in at the end. But actually all of those were kind of apart from the, the goal, doing of his own making, having to be in the right position and hoping the ball broke his way. Um, the goal itself was Spurs finally used a width. Lamella, clever ball over the top. Son laid the ball in and, and Kane finishing up. But I do feel sorry for him. 
how he's managed to get 19 goals in essentially what is half a season for a Tottenham side struggling to create chances is beyond me. I think it's 29 in all for club and country, despite all the problems he's had. Um, you know, Harry Kane is not the problem. I've seen people saying, sell him. Um, God knows who you get in to replace Harry Kane. I've seen people saying, uh, you know, he's not able to play, uh, score as many because the team's not built around him. He's still scoring goals. Um, don't get me wrong, I don't think Spurs are playing the best way for him right now, but, you know, this is a guy who, despite everything happening to him, is still scoring the goals, and that just sh screams world-class to me. It really does. He's he's not near anywhere near his best, you know. He's not the season when I think, wasn't it in the calendar year, he scored more than Messi and Ronaldo. Of course he's not there right now, but I do hope that Mourinho works out a way that doesn't use him as a battering ram next season and actually gets the best out of him, because there's enough creative players in there to do that. Uh, so that's them. Giovanni de Celso struggled, which, you know, ooh, that's alien for me, quite frankly, this season. He's been superb, but when you when he is not being able to th thread passes through and everything, you know there's an issue. For me, I, I almost wish Spurs could clone him, because I'd love to see a Lo Celso type playing in the deeper role. And then also, when Lo Celso gets near the box, Sheffield United aside, he's creating more than the other players who are doing those roles. I'd love to see two of them in those roles, but we can't clone as of yet human beings. Um, the back four, yeah, disappointing. Like I say, Aurier, if he, his role is to be a winger, that's what his job is. Um, and if he's not doing that, it essentially becomes redundant because his defending, we know, is very hit and miss. He was back to doing the kind of lack of tracking back, losing his man, as you think it was the second goal he did that for. Uh, Davies was disappointing for me after I thought he was superb against West Ham uh, in this one he struggled to get forward perhaps he wasn't told to but in his defending switched off a couple of times uh, most notably when him and Dyer both let Mousse score that goal um, it was quite telling though I thought when Vertonghen came on Spurs still conceded that third goal and it came down the, the full, bank, uh, full back side Vertonghen too easily beaten um, and Dyer and Sanchez, you know, after looking like a really good partnership, oh, that moment uh, it was the Musa goal when just Sanchez, uh, uh, sorry, it was Dyer and Davies completely just standing there watching him put the ball in the net, and then Sanchez beaten so easily for the third goal as well. Um, I think it pretty much opens up a door for Toby Alderweireld. I've seen people saying, oh, you know, why isn't Alderweireld playing and all of this? Alderweireld was not shining before the, the break in football. He wasn't. You know, he, he's been a terrific defender and obviously signed that new deal. But to kind of claim that he was having a pivotal, brilliant role in the back line was not true. Um, he was struggling. He, um, his anticipation wasn't quite where it was. And, and he was having an issue in that back line. So I do wonder, I think he'll probably come back in against Everton unless Mourinho really wants to say to this defence, look, I believe in you. Uh, but I'd be surprised. I think Alderweire will come in. And then it's up to him and whether he and Dyer can kind of form that partnership. Because I can't see him playing with Sanchez anymore. It's just unbalanced. Dyer can play on that left of the, the centre-back pairing. Unless Vertonghen comes in, which I personally can't probably see. Unless he comes in at left-back for Davies. But like I said, he didn't have a great time either. So, yeah, I'm really disappointed. It's I think you can probably hear it in my voice. Um, and I'm sure you guys were just as much... All of the little signs of promise uh, were essentially kind of stamped out. And um, it's going to be really interesting to see motivation-wise and morale-wise how they come back against Everton, who are unbeaten um, since the restart. They, they've kind of started to get their act together under Ancelotti, and it's just not going to be an easy game. Um, I'd imagine there'll be a few changes. You know, Tongayon Dembele came on. He, he didn't pull up any trees. He did play a good pass through to Kane, although he was offside. Uh, you could argue maybe the pass should have come sooner or Kane should have um, delayed his run slightly. But, yeah, did he come on and blow everyone away? No, him and Deli Ali both didn't. Um, they, they didn't really impact the game much at all. But I would wonder, you know, with the Premier League, sorry, Champions League now out of Tottenham's reach, does that mean that you now invest in someone like Ondan Bele? Do you say, look, OK, I'm going to give you a, real number of games you know it's probably not gonna be every game because it's gonna to have to rotate but I'm gonna give you some games to show me exactly what you can do this is almost like your your trial of, of how I can use you next season in Mourinho's mind um, I'd like to see that um, I think 
he's got a lot of proving to do. He's an incredibly talented guy, Tonga Undermele, but in terms of what he's actually producing on the pitch, it's not quite meriting the bluster of, you know, oh, he should play. Uh, a little bit like I was saying about Alderweireld, you know, he wasn't pulling up trees when he was getting starts before the break. Absence really kind of makes the heart grow fonder sometimes for players, doesn't it? I think he's got a lot to do. You know, like the cell, so he's got to prove himself. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to see him coming in. You know, I'd, I'd be stunned if Oliver Skip doesn't get a start before the end of the season as well. I do think there's a plan there to to bring him through for next season. And, you know, if the games aren't do or die, maybe you bring him in and let him kind of settle, perhaps in that defensive midfield role. Um, yeah, it's, it's going through my head all the kind of the ways you could change things. I think Lamella will likely come in. I thought probably one of the few players to come out with a bit of credit. I thought he came on and did quite well. Pivotal part in the goal. Um, he just naturally up Spurs tempo, which just isn't there at times, especially against Sheffield United. That was that was woeful. Um, what other changes? Winks. Harry Winks will probably come in. Harry Winks gets a, a tough time. I don't know whether it's because he's... English, maybe homegrown, maybe they get a buzz of excitement early in their careers and, and then that kind of dies off and then everyone wants exciting foreign signings to come in or replace them. I don't know, but I did feel against Sheffield United, Spurs lack that guy that is just going to sit there um, and kind of and mop up a lot of stuff. You know, he's not ideal in the role. He's still learning it. You know, he told me that before Mourinho was working on that defensive side. But the problem with Sissoko and the Celso is it's... Very mobile partnership, but weirdly that's also kind of a weakness because they're often charging forward or, say, Sissoko's over covering Aurier, and, and you kind of miss that one player just sitting there and doing an, a, an effective, albeit basic-looking job, and, and Winks can do that. Um, and it obviously opens up then a, an opportunity to play with a three. Um, or, you know, possibly you play with Winks on Dembele and then you push Lo Celso further up so he can do more damage. Um, in those attacking roles, you know, it's it's something to think about. Um, you know, I do think we'll maybe we'll see a couple of the youngsters on the bench in the in the re remaining games. You know, you've got Dennis Serkin. Um, what else you got on that bench? You've got Troy Parrott is expected back. Really, he he possibly could come back into the fold. Um, you'd hope you'd hope he gets some minutes. Um, uh, Malachi Fagan Walcott as well. I think Harvey White's been training with the first team. You know, if if even Europa League's out of the question, then it's probably not the worst thing in the world to give some of these young, you know, blood them, gives them some minutes. So next season when you're going to need them or, or you want to use them, it's not going to be a culture shock to them. Um, obviously playing in front of a massive crowd probably is, but it's going to be slightly different in that respect. But yeah, yeah, not, not, not great. Um, there will be rotation. He's already said that today, Mourinho, that they are going to have to change up because there's so many games now in quick succession. Um, but, I mean, it comes down to the other thing. You know, I'm sure you guys will say in the comments below whether whether you actually want Europa League or not. You know, if, if that's an option, is that something that's worth even trying for? Obviously, Leicester and Chelsea in previous years have been examples of teams that, without any European distraction, were then able to go and win the title purely because they were fresher, uh, they were playing most of the time just once a week. Um, and you were able to play all of your best players. You know, is that something that Mourinho could then use for this predicted uh, title push that he said a couple of times will happen next season? Or do you get the Europa League? And Mourinho obviously won that at United. He won it at Porto. Does it become then something that starts this winning mentality? You know, Mourinho's got a real history of this going for a a competition that maybe isn't seen as a major one, but using it as a snowball effect to then lead to others. Um, could that be the one for Tottenham? You know, personally as a journalist, obviously I'd love to uh, go on some more kind of European adventures, as it were, and especially Europa League throws up very different kind of ones, lots of Scandinavian trips and stuff like that as well. Um, and, and if he does use more of his squad in those games, and, you know, you're going to see lots of these younger players and... and uh, it's a way of keeping everyone as happy as possible. I don't think it's a way of bringing in new signings. You know, I think I've, I've had a couple of people ask me that in recent days. It's not the Champions League. It, it doesn't, you know, it's not got this massive allure financially. It doesn't bring in lots of money either. I've had someone at a club told me a couple of years back that you actually, they made a loss in their 
um, Europa League kind of journey because the, the TV money obviously is nowhere near the riches of the Champions League. But it's a transfers thing that's just, I find so interesting to see what they're going to do this um, in the next window, which, which will open at the end of the season because there's not a lot of money. You know, I've gone on and on about it in previous videos, you know, 200 million pound estimated losses. But this team needs investment in some form, even if it's just being clever and getting the right people who aren't incredibly expensive. But that was why Mourinho coming out today and saying no older players kind of knocked me for six slightly because that's where your cheaper players are who can do a job in the roles you require. So by not going that, you are going for more pricey players. And it does lead me to believe that you, they're going to have to look to sell on players. Even Mourinho said, though, when asked about players that might leave the club, he said, oh, I can't really tell you because the market is going to be so strange. We don't know who we're going to be able to sell on. Not going to be able to, you're not going to know what value you're going to get for them. Um, and that obviously has a knock-on effect on who they can buy. It's, uh, I'm sorry, it's quite a depressing video. It's really not... I'm not giving you guys a lot to kind of look forward to, but it is. I can't see the way that this transfer window is going to operate unless Spurs find money from somewhere. Um, you know, we know Joe Lewis isn't going to pump money in. It's never been his way in the 20 years previously, which is, I think, ultimately frustrating because this is the window that UEFA has said, look, we're going to relax financial fair play regulations because we know you clubs are going to need to find money from somewhere, which, you know, surely is only going to benefit the likes of the Manchester Cities that they've called into disrepute before um, and PSG who have fallen foul of their regulations. You know, clubs like that are then going to be able to have their wealthy owners pump in money. And it's kind of make this playing field even less level than it is right now. You know, even Liverpool um, have got big issues in terms of who they're going to bring in. Obviously, don't get me wrong, they're probably not going to need to bring in many people. They've just won the league. Um, so they probably only need to make a slight tweak and maybe they get that from selling on players. But Tottenham... Yeah, Marino has made this very clear about this mentality issue and, and to fix that you do need fresh faces. Tottenham need fresh faces so they're going to have to be so clever in what they do. Um, very much when we always spoke before about Pochettino players, players that fit the philosophy and mould of a Pochettino team, they're going to have to now do that for Mourinho and that may be very different targets to what they were looking at before. Mourinho is probably going to have to sit down and sound out and analyse every potential signing that's presented to him by, you know, Steve Hitchin and the scouting team. And it's yeah, clever. I think that's the word. They're going to have to be so clever in the way they choose these players because if they just bring in more of the same, Mourinho's not going to be able to build this winning philosophy. As great as what happened under Pochettino was, you know, things have gone backwards since then. Um, you know, Tottenham are very much in danger of finishing in the lowest position in the last 11, 12 years if they finish outside the top six. Um, so they need to look at a different way of doing things. But if Mourinho is going to be uh, crammed or crowbarred into this long-running, I suppose, Enoch philosophy, the Daniel Levy way of, of buying young and, and, and creating players... Is, that, is he going to be able to do anything in the short term or is it always going to be a long-term potential thing with Tottenham? You know, I don't think Mourinho is the man for that. You know, if that's what you were looking for, Mourinho is your man to bring you short-term success that you can then build on with maybe later managers. We know about his three-year thing. Um, if you're saying to Mourinho, look, here's stuff so we can build slowly. Yeah, can't see it happening. You know, it, it's going to be a real... Um, kind of paradox in the way that works I, I can't see how that works so you're going to have to uh, really 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 probably more so than ever make sure that these are the right signings because there isn't money there to make mistakes uh so yeah sorry about that it was really depressing that one that's um probably an after effect of what happened on thursday um so we'll have that was a press conference for everton today so you'll have everton on monday night obviously and then i think I think we get a little break and then Wednesday's a press conference before Bournemouth and uh, and then the North London derby. Oh, can you imagine the end of this week? If the end of this week doesn't bring, I don't know, at least seven points, I think there's going to be uh, there's going to be a lot of kind of fretting and worrying around Tottenham and um, you know 
Maybe that's what Mourinho needs in a weird way. Maybe Mourinho needs that kind of worry about what's going to come next season for him to actually push through some of the things he wants um, from from the board. It's like it's the worst. It's like the perfect storm in a way of the worst time for Tottenham to not have funds uh, to really improve their team. You know, we know about the rebuild that Pochettino asked for two years ago. But right now, for a man who wants to absolutely rip up and change the philosophy at Tottenham, and clearly this group of players need a hell of a lot of work to get there. He says they only need a couple of new additions, a little tweak here and there. But when you're going to get performances like you do against Sheffield United, it just reminds you of the ones against Bayern Munich, Leipzig, Brighton. We've seen so many this season where the head loss has gone. Um, I think, personally, it probably needs a little bit more than those one or two. There's a lot of talent there, but mentality-wise, it's lacking. The winners, you would struggling to find that in that team. I think you need a couple of captain types to come in there. You know, there's different opinions on whether the ones at Tottenham right now are the figures that can properly lead this team. Uh, I worry that when the chips are down and things are starting to go against Tottenham, whether those voices are big enough and heard enough. Uh, and I'm including Kane and Lloris in that as well. Um, I, I think that they need another couple of big voices in there. Um, but Mourinho says no experienced players. Uh, it's going to look for that type of player. So, hey, he's the one with the track record. Who am I to, to disagree with that? But um, I want to see a plan. I want to see a plan on the pitch. That was worrying with the attacking. It just didn't, it almost looked like, we're trying to sort the defence. You guys just go out as a collection of individuals and whatever you can do, great. Um, he said afterwards they had been doing stuff in training they didn't do on the pitch, but for me, I couldn't see it. Um, it was really all over the place. People running into it. There was, there was one moment when Eric Lamella ran through and he waited, he waited. He was drawing players to him, giving Kane space. And finally, Kane was in space. He looked to pass it. Lucas Moura arrived from nowhere and just ran straight in the middle and the ball cannoned off his leg. It was like, come on, guys. You know, just watch the Man United match earlier against Bournemouth. Yes, I know Bournemouth are struggling, but the attacking play, the, the link-up was just wonderful. And there's no reason with the players Tottenham have that they can't do that. Um, so for me, that was slightly worrying, you know, especially when the defence is meant to be the main bit that's been worked on isn't even working either. Um, God, I'm getting even more into the depths of um, bringing you all down with me there. But yeah, so I want to see a plan. I want to see leadership. And I want to see a way forward. Um, and I pretty much would imagine that's exactly what Mourinho wants as well. So on that slightly depressing note, I'm going to end there. And uh, hopefully I haven't put you off coming back for the video after Everton. But I hope you do. Um, and as always, stay safe, stay well. And uh, I shall talk to you after the Everton game. Catch you later.